I want to begin in Acts chapter 1 and work through the book of Acts. We'll read three passages from Acts, and then I want to read four from the epistles. We're into the fifth study now. The first three studies were from the Old Testament, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan, and the kingdom of Israel. The next three are all from the New Testament, and yesterday we focused attention on Jesus, the kingdom of Christ. Today we're focusing attention on the third person of the Trinity, the connection between the kingdom and the Holy Spirit, and then tomorrow we reach the grand finale of the kingdom of the Father. That's the term that is used for what will happen at the end of the line, the grand climax where all the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of Christ, and he hands them back to Father. And the phrase that is used for the final state of the kingdom is that it's the kingdom of the Father. Not just the kingdom of God, that's where you begin. It ends with the kingdom of the Father. So today we're looking at the connection between the kingdom and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized in water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Turn to chapter 14, uh, verse 21. It's talking about Paul and Barnabas. And it says, They preached the good news in that city, and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. I'm so glad that Jesus and the apostles were honest. I've heard some preachers who seem to imply, come to Jesus and your troubles are over. It's the exact opposite that is the truth. Come to Jesus and your troubles have begun. Big troubles. And in the world you will have tribulation, he said, big trouble. But cheer up, I'm on top of the world. He went through troubles and he promised us nothing less. So if you want a trouble-free life, don't become a Christian, don't get filled with the Spirit. It's the way into trouble. In fact, um, I was asked by a group of leaders, what is the sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit? And I said, well, there's one infallible sign that comes every time, trouble. Whatever other manifestations of the Spirit, you know you've been filled when you get into more trouble. It's an infallible sign. Well, let's turn to the last chapter of the book of Acts. Um, chapter 28. And uh, we'll start at verse 23 and read to the end. Uh, the, the Jews in Rome arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. And from morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the Lord Moses and from the prophets. I'm rather uh, encouraged by that. I've been doing this week exactly what Paul did in Rome, explaining and declaring the kingdom of God. And some were convinced by what he said, but others wouldn't believe. I notice that it doesn't say they couldn't, it says they wouldn't. Do you notice this? If you don't want to believe, you don't. And it's, it's not that people can't, it's that they won't. So some were convinced and others wouldn't believe. And that's usually what happens when you explain the kingdom of God. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. And again, not a very tactful one. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understand. You will be ever seeing but never perceive. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their ears, with their eyes, sorry, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we get into the epistles or letters of the New Testament. The very next one is Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says this. I'm just trying to show you that the theme of the early church was the same theme that I'm taking this morning. Says Paul, writing to the Romans, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved to men. Now we turn to the next letter, which is 1 Corinthians, and chapter 6 and verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9. And Paul, writing to Christians, says, Do you not know? that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. You remember I told you that deception is Satan's work? Christians can be deceived on this very matter. 
And Paul writing to Christians says, don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now that's quite a statement. The early church was full of people who had been that. And one of the reasons why our present day churches are, are not full of love and power and righteousness and peace and joy may well be that we haven't got too many ex-swindlers and ex-drunkards and ex-slanderers and ex-homosexuals in our churches. But I'll tell you this, if you want to find genuine New Testament Christianity, you go to where? You find people like that who have been washed and sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God and you touch genuine Christianity. You go to some of the prisons in our land. Do you know that God is doing a new thing right through the prisons in our land? For example, in the prisons of Belfast, you'll find ex-Protestant terrorists and ex-IRA terrorists praising God together inside the prison. And there's a touch of genuine Christianity there. They've been forgiven. And uh, didn't you like that song last night? I'm forgiven. The person who wrote that must be bursting with relief. Well, let's turn over now to another letter, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. Do you realize the significance of that? If you live by the Spirit, you don't do what the flesh wants. If you live by the flesh, you don't do what the Spirit wants. So you've got a choice, and you can live either way. But whichever way you live will prevent you from doing what the other wants. Do you follow that? And the Christian has a choice every day of living in the Spirit or living in the flesh. You are now free to make that choice. Do you know what the greatest freedom is? Most of us in our youth thought the greatest freedom was to do what you wanted. The greatest freedom is not to do what you want. Or to put it another way, true freedom is freedom not to sin. And only those who live in the Spirit know that freedom. Nobody else does. It's a great freedom not to sin. So let's read on. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. In other words, if the Spirit is telling you what to do and you do it, nobody will ever need to tell you about the laws. You won't ever need to be given rules for your life. You won't ever need to be given regulations. You're not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Have you ever heard of a law forbidding joy? Or forbidding love? Or telling you you mustn't be patient? There are no laws. Once you're into the fruit of the Spirit, you're out of laws. You don't ever need to think about them. There are no laws against that. So you can be quite sure you won't break any rules if the fruit of the Spirit is growing. By the way, the fruit of the Spirit is singular. It's only one. The works of the flesh are plural. There are many. Any of those works of the flesh could appear in you just by themselves. But the fruit of the Spirit is one fruit with nine flavors. And you can't have one of these nine things without the other eight. They grow together. There are some fruits that have many different flavors. There's one particularly called Mysteriosis, Deliciosis. You may not believe me, but it grows in Spain and it has many different flavors. And you take a bite and you think it's like an orange. You take another bite and you think it's like a lemon. You take another bite and you think it's a grapefruit. And it's called Mysteriosis, Deliciosis. Has anybody ever tasted it? Have you? No? Nobody here ever had it. Well, will you take my word for it, please? And you notice that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. All those things appear in the life of someone who's living by the Spirit. So you must, you don't need to try and say, well, I'll try and love this year, and next year I'll try and get a bit of joy, and next year I'll try and get a bit of peace, and next year I'll really make a New Year's resolution to be more patient. You don't need any of that business. If you are living in the Spirit, that fruit will grow, and all nine flavors will appear. The flesh can reproduce some of those flavors as a kind of substitute. You know, some people are really happy and joyful, but you'll find a number of the other flavors missing. Some people are very placid in temperament and very peaceful, and so they show peace, but you find they don't show much um, self-control. And so you'll only find all these nine things appearing together in a life that is living in the Spirit. That's the secret of a character. And those who live in the Spirit will produce all those nine things. They will grow, not immediately. They grow gradually and they ripen. It takes time. The gifts of the Spirit can appear immediately. You can speak in tongues immediately. But you can't produce any of these immediately. These will grow as on a fruit tree over a period as you live in the Spirit. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And just one last one. Uh, Colossians, just over the page. Chapter 1 and uh, verse 9. 
For this reason, Paul says, and the reason is that he's heard about their love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Right, well now let's talk about the kingdom and the spirit. Even during our Lord's lifetime on earth, he had already linked together the kingdom and the spirit. In fact, have you noticed the poster that's coming off the notice board of the Church of Scotland just around the corner? You notice the poster there, it says, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But what is born again? I've heard many, many sermons on born again, and not one of them ever mentioned water. Yet Jesus says to be born again is to be born of water and spirit. And Nicodemus would have no doubt whatever what he was referring to. Nicodemus would immediately think of baptism, because the Pharisees to whom Nicodemus belonged were refusing to be baptized. There's an outside and an inside to being born again. Baptism is important. Except a man be born from above, born again. Not entering into his mother's womb and going through all that again, but being born of water and spirit. That's how Jesus defined being born again. It's important that he use two words there, water and spirit. They are both part of being born again. So Jesus already linked them there. He also linked the kingdom and the spirit when he cast out demons. And he said, if I, by the spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And you'll find many, many such links in the life of Jesus between the kingdom and the spirit. And in fact, he was only able to bring the kingdom as he did because he had been anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Before he'd been anointed himself with the Holy Spirit, he didn't release a single person from disease or from demons. He didn't perform a single miracle. He just made chairs and tables and door frames with his hands. It was when he was anointed with power in the Holy Spirit that he began to go about doing good. So that even Jesus himself could not have re-established the kingdom of God on earth in power without the Holy Spirit. And therefore when he left earth and the heavens received him again, the disciples might have thought, well that's goodbye to the king and goodbye to the kingdom. But he had other plans. And his plans were that just as he had been anointed with power at the age of 30 and then began to demonstrate the kingdom, they would also have an anointing with power in the Holy Ghost and repeat what he had done. They would heal the sick. They would raise the dead. They would release people from demons. They would demonstrate the kingdom with power. I think it was D.L. Moody who said, if a man could be filled with the same Holy Spirit that enabled Jesus to do what he did, what could that man not do? It's breathtaking. Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do. And even greater. I still cannot come to terms with that statement of Jesus. Can you do it? I keep wondering what greater means. What could you do that would be greater than Jesus? Well, I guess in scale, I can understand a bit of that. Yongi Cho has the biggest church in the world, as you've heard, with hundreds of thousands of members. Jesus never got more than 12. So I guess that's a great work. Isn't it amazing that Jesus should say, the power I've had, I'm going to give to you, and you will carry on the business. I'll be doing it through you. All that I began to do and teach, it's not stopping, but now I'll do it through you. So you wait in Jerusalem until you've got the power that I had. And so there's a very real sense in which, in our era, the kingdom is wherever the Spirit is. And this is why, 25 years ago, I never heard people talk about the Holy Spirit, did you? I, I mean, apart from the preacher on Whit Sunday. I mean, in normal conversation, people in church never talked about the Holy Spirit, did they? Never mentioned him. Some of them never even talked about Jesus. You always talk about the people you know. And people didn't talk about the Holy Spirit 25 years ago. But in the last 15 years, have you noticed how the Holy Spirit has become a, a topic of normal conversation? Because people have got to know him. Maybe not where you are. Are you shaking your head like that to say no? <laughs> well, wherever I've been, I've heard people talking about the Holy Spirit. But have you noticed this? That about five or seven years after people start talking about the Holy Spirit, they start using the word kingdom. Have you noticed that? How the word kingdom is coming back in? I hardly ever heard the word kingdom used until the last five, seven years. And suddenly everywhere I go, people are using this word kingdom. Why? Because to discover the Spirit is to discover the kingdom. Now remember what I said, that the kingdom is made up of sovereign and subject. And you find that when the Holy Spirit really is given freedom to move, you will see two things demonstrated. You'll see the sovereignty of the kingdom demonstrated, and you'll see also subjects of the kingdom. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who brings both to us now. And you remember the double offer I talked about yesterday. Not only does God offer us release by his sovereignty, he is also offering us his righteousness to be a subject. And in the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit, you'll find you can't do the things that the flesh wanted to do. Because the two are incompatible. We were praying earlier this morning for the problem of alcoholism in Strathspey. And those who are gripped with a power and, and just have such a habit of drinking, they can't break it. They could find that living in the Spirit, that could be utterly broken. 
and he could take away all taste. My wife and I stayed in South Africa with a lovely Greek family. He was an ice cream parlor owner who'd retired. And um, they sold the business, and he and his wife are lovely. Greek and his wife, they sold their business. They got a lot of money, and they said, right now, we're going to enjoy ourselves. We're going to really live it up. We're going to do everything we've always wanted to do. We've got enough money. And, and this Greek told me, he said, do you know what happened? Our daughter has to go and become a Christian. Just when we retire, and just when we've got enough money to do everything we want, and she has to go and get religious. And he said, worse than that, within a few months, both I and my wife became Christians. But he said, even after we became Christians, there was one thing we could not break, and it was uh, smoking. We both smoked like factory chimneys, and we just couldn't break it. So he said, um, I'll tell you what we did. We decided to ask for baptism, and we were going to be baptized on a Sunday morning. So he said, on the Saturday evening, we got a big carton of cigarettes. My wife and I went into the bathroom, and we put towels around the cracks in the door, so nothing would get out and tell the daughter what we were doing. And we both sat on the edge of the bath, and we smoked our way through that carton of cigarettes. And then this Greek ice cream parlor owner prayed like this. He said, Satan, you may be laughing tonight, but you'll be crying tomorrow morning because we're getting baptized. And they trusted the Holy Spirit as they went into the water. And he said, we came out of the water totally free of any desire ever to touch them again. He was free. And they've been walking in the Spirit since. And so they don't do what the flesh wants to do. The current's incompatible. You either walk in the flesh, and you can read in Galatians the kind of works that that will produce in your life, arguing, broken relationships, self-indulgence. It'll all happen. Or you choose to walk in the Spirit, in which case the kingdom will be demonstrated in your life and you're free of those things. But you can never be both at the same time. You know that little verse that says those who are in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its desires? Do you realize that the word crucify doesn't mean to kill? It means to nail to a cross. But it takes a long time for someone who's crucified to die. Jesus was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning, but he didn't die till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Most That was very quick. Most people crucified took 3, 4 days. Many took 7 days. Not long ago, uh, some muggers down in London got hold of a young boy and they crucified him on Hampstead Heath. They nailed him to a tree. And they left him there and he wasn't found for 24 hours. But he was alive and they pulled the nails out and took him to Hampstead Hospital and he survived. That verse that says you've crucified the flesh means you've nailed him to the cross. But the problem is that it takes some time for the flesh to die. And the flesh says, take the nails out for this afternoon. Please, just give me a break. And if you take the nails out, he can be very much alive again. Listen, you leave your old life on the cross until it's dead. It's been crucified, it's been nailed there. Leave it there. Walk in the spirit. If you want to enjoy being a subject of the kingdom so that you want to do the right thing, so that you want to keep the commandments, so that you want to do it, then the simple thing is to walk in the spirit. There's a place for jumping in the spirit, there's a place for dancing in the spirit. You seem to have, you were born on a bed spring, brother. <laughs> um, but you do not enjoy being a subject of the kingdom just by jumping in the spirit or dancing in the spirit. You walk in the spirit to enjoy this. And walking is a fairly simple thing. I've been for my two mile walk this morning, which I'm trying to keep up to get back into trim and get my muscles working again. And walking is very simple. You just lift one foot and you put it down there. And then you lift the other and you put it down there. Walking is it's not very spectacular. I wasn't jumping or dancing down the country lane. I was just walking. And every step I took was in a direction I'd chosen. And I got a good way. Bit of a struggle. I was very worn out after last night. It was very much last night. But uh, I managed it this morning to walk. And I chose to walk down a particular lane in the country. Now you can choose to walk in the flesh today or you can choose to walk in the spirit. And when you have a step to take or a decision to make, if you say, right, spirit, which is your way, and you choose to take another step in that direction, you'll enjoy the power of the kingdom. Now you'll express it from time to time in jumping, dancing, or singing in the spirit or anything else. But the Bible is quite clear. It is walking in the spirit that produces the fruit of the spirit. It is taking one step after another in the direction he's leading. That's all. And I've been burdened this week to say, the Lord is looking for subjects of the kingdom. Can I spell that out? He's looking for people like you who will determine that you will follow the spirit wherever he leads. Go back to the question I asked in the first study. This old question of should I come out or should I stay in? I told you the answer there. Do what the Spirit leads you to do. That's all. And that's all that he asks of you. Not to weigh up the consequences, not to think of what people may think or say, but to say, whatever the Spirit clearly leads me to do, I will do. That's all you need to decide, to be a subject of the kingdom. But I have the feeling that many people's experience of the Holy Spirit has faded because at some point he was leading them to take a step which they were unwilling to take. That's all. I know that I don't go wrong through ignorance. I go wrong through disobedience, right? And there need be no talk. I don't talk about the charismatic renewal fading. I don't talk about it dying. You'll never hear me use it. I know I can see that in some people and in some churches it's fading and dying because there came a point where they said no further. I'm not prepared to take that step. And of course, their experience faded. But praise God, I meet hundreds of people who are still stepping out and who are saying, I'll still take every step the Spirit leads me to take. But you need to be sure that it is the Spirit. There are impulses of the flesh we need to watch. And there are suggestions from other people. So we are told to check everything out carefully. But all that God is asking from you 
is that you promise him that everything you know the spirit leads you to do you will do and you are a subject of his kingdom and the kingdom of God will be yours righteousness and peace and joy will be yours and you're free the two dangers for all Christians are legalism and license have you ever been on one of these paths like striding edge in the Lake District uh, up on Hell Valley where two big ice balls in the ice age have ground themselves into what we call corries uh, great hollows and left a sharp edge of rock like that and you can walk along the top uh, it's called striding edge there may be some such paths in Scotland for all I know but you're, you've almost got to be on your knees in a wind and, and I see the Christian life as walking along such an edge and on the one hand is the danger of dropping into legalism and oh isn't it awful to go into a fellowship that has become legalistic where the fellowship is constantly setting rules for each other. You know, don't do this, don't do that. There's a kind of dreadful atmosphere. I've been into churches and assemblies and fellowships that have turned legalistic. And somehow it's all become a matter of regulation and imposed standards and law. Everybody must wear a certain kind of hat. And, well, the ladies anyway, you know the kind of thing. And there's an oppressive spirit because of legalism. On the other hand, I have also met people who slipped down the other slope into license and who thought, well, now I'm, I'm a Christian. I've got my ticket to glory. I can do what I like. I can go on sinning. I can go on doing all these things. And Paul says to those who've fallen into license, to Christians who think they can do what they like, I've warned you before, those who go on doing those things will not inherit the kingdom. So what's the answer? The answer is neither legalism nor license. Legalism when Christians impose rules on each other, nor license where we kick over the traces and say, I'm forgiven, so I can do what I like. There is the liberty of the spirit, which is a very delicately balanced path in between both those things, where you are free in the spirit, to walk in the spirit, to follow the spirit, and it's real freedom. You are free from legalism, and you're free from license because both of those things are sheer slavery in legalism you become a slave to other people in license you become a slave to yourself in the spirit you're free are you hearing me this is the kingdom of god in which we may now live i'm amazed the good news is the kingdom of heaven you can live in it today friday sorry thursday where am i you can live in it today thursday the 4th of august i can live in the kingdom of heaven i can be sovereign and subject in the spirit power to live right and i can't help noticing that through the Acts and the Epistles, the emphasis is still on finding subjects for the kingdom. It's almost as if Jesus said, now you've got the Spirit, you must go everywhere in the world and do what I've been doing in Israel. And you must set people free from Satan, but what you're really after is to bring them into the kingdom as my subjects. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them how to do everything I've taught you. I think that's amazing. The ultimate target of evangelism is to produce a man or a woman who's able to do everything Jesus commanded. What an incredible task. We have whittled evangelism down to making decisions. But I believe that what Jesus sent us to do was not to get people to make decisions, but to make disciples. Which means to bring them right through to the point where they can do and want to do everything Jesus told us. And you'll never do that without introducing them to the Holy Spirit. I don't know whether to get sidetracked here or not, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to write a book on kingdom evangelism. And I believe we won't get back to the evangelism that Jesus wanted until the evangelist talks about being baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when these are a vital part of counseling every new believer. Listen, it's ten times easier for a new convert to be filled with the Spirit than a Christian who's been going for 25 years without that. Ten times easier. They're wide open. And I believe what God wants in the 80s is every person who comes forward to make a decision that they be introduced to the Holy Spirit. That instead of saying receive Jesus, which the New Testament never says, instead of saying receive Jesus as your Savior or receive him into your heart or receive him into your life, we stop talking like that, which is unscriptural, and we go back to the kind of evangelistic preaching of the Bible that says repent toward God, believe in the Lord Jesus, and receive the Holy Spirit. Not one evangelistic sermon in the New Testament ever told people to receive Jesus. So stop using that term. You can't receive Jesus. He's not around to receive. The heavens have received him now. Now, of course, when he was on earth, in the flesh, you could receive him. You could open your door and say, come in, Jesus. And when he came in the flesh, he came to his own people, the Jews, and, uh, and I'm afraid they didn't receive him, but those who did were given the power to become sons of God. But that verse in John's Gospel is not an evangelistic verse. It's a description of what happened when Jesus was on earth. From the day that Jesus was received back into the heavens, they never told people to receive Jesus ever again. They said, his place on earth has been taken by the Holy Spirit. He's the one you receive now. Believe on the Lord Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. And therefore, that's why Paul was desperately concerned about people whom he thought had believed without receiving. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He wanted to make sure that people had a first-hand introduction. I confess that my initiation into the kingdom was spread over far too many years. Do you know what I mean by that? It was years before someone talked to me about baptism in water. I'm glad I caught up on it, but I wish somebody had told me about that when I was converted. It would have been so much more appropriate. Some people say, oh, well, it's too late now. I've been a Christian 20 years. What's the point? Well, it's always right to put things right. I've led men and women to the Lord who've been living together for years and who were not married. And they could have said, what's the point of getting married now? But I always marry people like that and get the thing regularized. And yes, their, their wedding hasn't quite the same feel as it might have had, if it had it at the beginning. But it's vital that they put the thing right. And they're probably married in the sight of the Lord and in the sight of other people. And if you say, well, I've been 30 years, a bit late to get baptized now, it's right to put it right, even if it doesn't feel the same as if, as if it had been there at the beginning. 
Likewise, it was years before I heard about being baptized in the Spirit. And praise God, He's so patient that His Spirit had blessed me and used me and regenerated me and done everything. And then I found out years after I became a Christian that you could be filled to overflowing. I wish somebody had told me at the beginning. I would have had a better start. I believe that God is wanting us to bring people right into the fullness of the kingdom at the very start of the Christian life. Most of us have to catch up on these things over a period of years. Let's put it together again. Let's put repentance, faith, baptism, and being filled with the Spirit into the package deal for every believer. And we're going to see Christians who will streak past you. That reminds me of uh, a little... Uh, what was his name? Wayne. Wayne in New Zealand. I went to New Zealand uh, with my wife about a year ago, and we went to Dunedin. Uh, it's full of Scots Presbyterians. And I was told it was the Evangelist Graveyard. No connection with the previous sentence, but... Um, it's called Dunedin, which means New Eden. And it's New Edinburgh, and it's where the Scots who emigrated from here settled. Them. And Presbyterianism, when it loses its life, it becomes heavy. Very, very heavy. Calvinism is a deadening thing, if you lose the faith that Calvin had. And, and it was heavy and dead. And they said, nothing happens here. We never have big meetings here, because it, it, it's, it's the evangelist graveyard. And so they booked for me the Majestic Theatre, was it? I forget the name. The main theatre in the middle of Dunedin, for two nights. And the first night, Dunedin lived up to its reputation. Oh, boy. It was heavy going. Nothing much happening. Except that I met one remarkable young man. He was, well, he was about 32, maybe. I think he was a plumber. Very ordinary working man in his 30s, called Wayne. And Wayne had only been a Christian for three weeks. And he was converted and filled with the Holy Spirit in one fell swoop, in, in one day, without any church background, without any Christian help. And to meet Wayne, three weeks old, I sat at his feet and I learned from him. I tell you, he was filled with the Spirit. And that night he went to bed. And, and he was so excited. He slept soundly until three in the morning. Then he woke up. And he said, David, there was an angel standing at the foot of my bed. So I tried to look as if that happened most nights to me. And, 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 and I sort of said, to, and, and what happened then? Well, he said, um, he, he spoke to me and he said, uh, he said uh, I think I was rather rude to him because uh, I'm not used to talking to angels. So I said, well, well, what did he say? And he said, Wayne, today is your special day. And Wayne said, you got your clock wrong, mate. He said, it's, it's three in the morning. Yesterday was my special day. And the angel said, Wayne, you're not listening. Today is your special day. And he said, why? What's going to happen today? Is my wife going to get converted today? She was lying in bed alongside me. She was asleep. And uh, the angel said, Wayne, listen. Today is your special day. And Wayne turned to me at this point and said, David, I realized what he was trying to say, that I mustn't live on yesterday's experience. Now fancy learning that at three in the morning, the day after your conversion. Most Christians haven't learned that yet. Ask them to give their testimony they talk about 20 years ago. And Wayne said, every day I wake up and I say, Wayne, today is your special day. And for three weeks, he'd had 21 special days. I must tell you one other thing about him. I said, Wayne, we're not getting anywhere in this town, are we? We've got to have a prayer meeting before tonight's or tomorrow night's thing. So there was Wayne and about 30 others. And we prayed for a breakthrough. We used that name again, Baal Perizim, Lord of the Breakthrough. We said, Lord, give us a breakthrough tonight. In Dunedin, of all places, give us a breakthrough. And we got it. And I don't know how many people were in council that night, maybe a couple of hundred, but it, it, it was just such a response in this dead place. After the meeting was over and everybody had gone home, there were only two people left in the building, the Presbyterian minister who'd organized it and Wayne. And Wayne went into the theater foyer to go out and to go home. And, and he felt the Lord forbade him to go through those glass doors into the street. And he just stopped and said, can I go home? No. But, but Lord, what are you trying to say something to him? What are you trying to say? I can't, can't hear what you're trying to say. He couldn't get through. So finally he said, Lord, please, could I just go out for a breath of fresh air? I'll just walk around the block. I'll promise to come back in and then I'll listen to you. But I just can't hear you. I need some fresh air. And he said, the Lord gave me permission. So he said, he walked around the square. He came back in and he stood in the foyer. He said, now, Lord, what was it? And the Lord told him. And he got hold of the Presbyterian minister and took him back into the prayer room where they'd been before the service where we'd been. And he said to this Presbyterian minister, kneel, kneel down, get on your knees, and he knelt down with him. And he said, I hope you don't think this is critical, but he said, the Lord wouldn't let me go out of the foyer tonight. And, and he said, he's got something to say. And what he said to me was this, Wayne, they asked me for a breakthrough. I gave it to them, but no one came back to say thank you. So Wayne said, come on, say thank you. This is a three-week-old spiritual baby. And I tell you, I spent every minute I could with him, drinking in from him what the Lord was teaching. And I believe he's God's prophet to Dunedin. Let's not rob new Christians of the power of the kingdom through the Holy Spirit. Why do we have to wait till we've read a book or gone to a convention before we join that power? Listen, I want to encourage you. Everybody who comes to Christ within reach of you, introduce them to the power of the kingdom through the Holy Spirit. Teach them how to walk in the Spirit. Don't give them a list of rules. Teach them how to respond to the Spirit. I remember a tall, very good-looking, ginger-haired lady who started attending our church. She looked like a mannequin. Um, and she came to Christ. And, and she came to me afterwards and she said, uh, I've got a problem. Uh, I said, what's your problem? She said, my job. I said, what's your job? She said, I'm the proprietor of a chain of betting shops. What's the name? Betting? Yes. Uh, and I said, well, what's your problem? And she said, well, I'm a Christian now. What do I do about these? And she said, it's a really good business because it's in Aldershot, the home of the British Army. Can you imagine me? It's a little gold mine to run a chain of betting shops in the British Army. But she said, uh, should I be doing this as a Christian? I said, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, she said, you're the sixth person in the church I've asked, and they've all said the same thing. <laughs> she was quite frustrated. I'm just so thrilled that nobody in our church told her she mustn't do that. And didn't bring her under legalism. You know what I mean? Didn't make rules for her. Thou shalt not do that. 
She said, what do I do? I said, well, she said, how do I find out? I said, well, try sharing the business with Jesus for a week. She said, how do I do that? Well, I said, you keep talking to him. As you take the money off the soldiers, you just say, Jesus, how do you feel about this, taking this money? And as you make up the books at the end of the day and find out how much profit you've done, uh, say, Jesus, how do you like that? Just try it for a week. Just share the business with him. She came back the next Sunday. She said, it's been a disaster. She said, all the books have gone wrong. We haven't even made a profit this week. It's, it's been one disaster area after another. She sold the business. She bought a tea shop. Listen, we must trust the spirit more to lead. Instead of making rules for people, and getting them into legalism, or falling the other way and saying, oh, you can do what you like now, you've got your ticket to heaven, you forgive them, do what you like. Let's be honest and let's tell them about the Spirit, how to walk in the Spirit, how to be led in the Spirit, how to enjoy the kingdom. Now then, I've spent far too long on that side of what I wanted to say this morning. So let me rush on to the other side of things. So far, I have been concentrating almost exclusively on the individual walking in the Spirit. But in Galatians 6, the word walk in the Spirit occurs twice. And the first time the word walk means to walk by yourself, left, right, left, right, in the Spirit. But the second time, walk in the Spirit, the word used is march in step. And I can only begin this part of the subject this morning. I think I'll have to continue it tomorrow. But let me just spend 10 minutes with it. If there's one thing that comes clearly out of the New Testament, it is this. The kingdom is to be enjoyed together. Walking in the Spirit is not something you'll manage on your own. It is keeping in step with others who are walking in the Spirit. And one of the reasons some of you may not be enjoying as much of the Spirit and His power as you might is that you're trying to do it on your own. Some of you, I sense, are having to be too far from other spiritual Christians. You must pray that the Lord will show you what to do about that. It might even be that you haven't found those you need to find in the area where you But it's quite clear that it was Jesus' intention not just to have a lot of subjects walking in the Spirit by themselves, but that they be communities in the Spirit, that they enjoy fellowship in the Spirit. I don't think I would have been here today if I hadn't had fellowship in the Spirit with others also walking in the Spirit. God never intended you to do it on your own. And that's why when he was looking for subjects of the kingdom, he called 12 to be the nucleus, and they had to live together and sleep together and walk together and share their lives with each other. And when you look at them, they were the most unlikely mix of people you could imagine. And yet on the night before he died, he said, I have just one thing that I want you to do. Love each other. And the power of the Spirit is the power not only to cause an individual to live right and be a separate, but the power of the Spirit is the power to get on with the most unlikely people and be a harmonious community in the Spirit. In other words, the church is what I'm talking about. Not the building down the road with a steeple and a bell, but the people inhabited by the Spirit of God. The church is people. Some of you are guilty of misguided loyalty. Now, what I'm going to say will be misunderstood and misquoted, but I'm going to say God never called you to be loyal to a denomination because he doesn't even think denomination. He called you to be loyal to him and to his body, not to a denomination. Nor did he ever call you to be loyal to a minister. Nor did he ever call you to be loyal to a church building. But there are Christians who are held up all over the place because of misguided loyalty. They've put that loyalty before their loyalty to the king and their loyalty to his subjects. To move from one denomination to another may simply mean to move from one part of his body to another. And I believe many Christians need to be finding their place in the body where they will be fulfilled, matured, and developed because so many of their gifts are being held back because they're never used. The things they're discovering in the spirit are being lost because they're never expressed. Do you think that's the will of God? There's a misguided loyalty. Now, if the Lord has told you to stay in that denomination, in that church building and with that minister, that's a different thing. But you're doing it out of loyalty to the king, not out of loyalty to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if the Lord tells you to shift to another part of his body where he can fit you in and develop you and grow you and use your gifts, that is not disloyalty to the part you're leaving. You are still loyal to the king and to his kingdom. But you need to find the community in which he meant you to be. You need to find other spirit-filled people. And above all, you need to be under spirit-filled leadership. That's an absolute must. You can't have a community without leadership. And you can't have a spirit-led community that is not led by spirit-led leaders. When I was in Australia, I went to um, a place called Shepparton for one night at the invitation of a farmer. And this young farmer, bless him, had faith to book the town hall in Shepparton, which had never been booked for a religious meeting, in a little one-horse town, uh, largely agricultural marketing, where there were a few little churches, but they had never seen a large gathering of Christians. And this young farmer got in touch with me and he said, will you come? He said, I'd book the town hall, which seats 1,100. And he said, um, come. So I went. And you know, we had a revival. It was packed. They'd come in for 50 and 60 miles, all these farmers. And there were 1,100 people there. And the Holy Ghost just spoke to us. And before the evening, the Holy Ghost said, I have given you this town. And you wonder what can happen in one night. But I tell you, the sound of weeping in that hall could be heard down the high street. The Spirit just came down on me. And, and you know, my heart, as I looked at all these people, so eager, so hungry, it was the first time I'd seen anything like it. I thought, but I've got to leave tomorrow morning. What can I do to help them to keep what they found? I said, Lord, have you got a, a word for them? And he gave me a prophetic word. When I get a prophetic word, it's usually no longer than one sentence. 
but it's usually so clear and so simple that people get it. Others may have longer words from the Lord, but I tend just to get sometimes a phrase that just puts it right on the spot. And I heard a sentence from God, and I said, listen, God has begun to move in this place. And you may be wondering, where do you go from here? How do you follow through? How do you keep what, what he's given you? I said, here's his word for you. Follow the men who follow the Lord. And that was all. And I said, I'm going to look around. And I'm going to ask the Lord to show me the men who are led by the Spirit in this place. And he showed me three. Three men. And I knew they were the men who were being led by the Spirit. And I said, follow these men. Now you can imagine what a furor that caused. Because there were more churches than three. But listen, God's way of establishing his kingdom has always been through men led by the Spirit and people willing to follow men led by the Spirit. And some of you need to hear that. However will the kingdom be established if you follow men who are not led by the Spirit, who are therefore not experiencing the kingdom themselves? Now hear me on this. Don't let misguided loyalty prevent you from following the men who follow the Lord. That's why I want to spend time with the leaders this afternoon. Just because a man turns his collar back to front and has degrees after his name, that doesn't mean that that's the one you've got to follow. I'm sorry, I'm speaking bluntly and plainly because I want to see the kingdom established in Scotland. You can empty the church by degrees, did you know that? I've got some myself, so I'm not just being envious or jealous or knocking other people. Listen, the qualification for leadership in the kingdom is that a man is led by the Spirit. It's the only qualification I know. And what I see happening all over England, and I believe it'll happen in Scotland if it's not happening already, is that God is going to raise up taxi drivers and, and lathe operators and farmers and butchers and bakers and candlestick makers and fill them with his Spirit and make them leaders of his kingdom. And you will need to recognize those leaders and follow them. They may never have been near a theological cemetery, but you need to follow them. I use that term deliberately. Are you hearing me? If we're to march together as an army, if we're to be a community in the kingdom, then we're going to need spirit-led leaders to follow. And if you are not led by a spirit-led leader, then I would ask you to ask the Lord to show you how you can get in line with his purposes. That is the way it happened all through the Bible. There comes a man from God, and the people follow. When Deborah had to step in because no man had enough courage to, and Deborah stepped in and had to take decisions for the people of God, she told them, because no man would take the lead, then God will give Sisera into the hands of a woman. And, and he did. Sisera died of surprise. Such a thing had never entered his head before. You can read the story in, in the book of Judges. But after the whole thing was over, after Sisera was defeated, Deborah sang a song to the Lord. And this was her song. That the leaders led and that the people followed, praise the Lord. That was her phrase. That's how the kingdom happens. When God raises up a leader full of his spirit and led by his spirit, he expects his people to follow. Not in a slavish way. I'll say more about this tomorrow. We're not called to authoritarianism. I'll be speaking to the leaders about that a bit this afternoon. But the key, I believe, to the establishment of the kingdom of Scotland is going to be spirit-led leaders. That's going to be the key. And if you haven't got them around, you should be praying for them. Praying very hard. Lord, will you fill men with your Holy Spirit so that they're led by you and we can get behind them. That's how it'll happen. Now, what I've just been saying in the last 10 minutes will be widely, as I say, misquoted, misunderstood. And even if it is properly understood and properly quoted, there will be an offensiveness in it. I'm prepared to be shot at. I'm prepared to take that offense. It's been coming now for three years, coming thick and fast from those who feel terribly threatened. But I must be honest before the Lord and tell them what I've just told you. The kingdom comes through spirit-led believers getting behind spirit-led leaders. There is no other way. Because God can't bring the kingdom just with one individual here and another there and another there who have been baptized in the spirit to enjoy edifying themselves in tongues and, and then sit in a dead situation sitting on all the other gifts they might use. Just one another. For some of you, it will mean that you have to ask the Lord where you have to live. Maybe he wants you to move house to where you can get in line with what he's doing. That's for him to say. I find a great freedom when I'm counseling people and saying, it's not for me to tell you. It's for you to be willing to be a subject of the kingdom. I'll help you to be. But in the last analysis, you can seek his will. Well, that's a serious note on which to finish, and I realize it puts some of you on the spot. I don't apologize for that. Because I'd be more hurt if I left you in a situation where you're going to suppress your gifts, where you're not going to develop what the Spirit is doing in you, where you're going to be, as it were, useless to the kingdom because you're not in a community of the Spirit, where together you can keep in step and march in the Spirit. Lord, we want to be your subjects. We want to live where you tell us to live. We want to be the part of your body where you joined us in. We want to be free from denominationalism. We want to be free from misguided loyalties. We want to be loyal to you and to each other as true subjects of the kingdom. Will you please teach us how? May we walk in the Spirit every step we take. May we take it only as the Spirit leads us. And may we bear the fruit of the Spirit for all to see and produce the works of the kingdom and set people free to be good. Release them for righteousness. I ask it in Jesus' name.